Hello, everyone. Um, as you're coming in, please let us know where you're tuning in from. Um, something I always ask. Uh, we're always curious to see where folks are. Um, I'm in East Hartford. Um, I'm not at the house. This is not a real background. Um, I know Anita is in Connecticut somewhere because <laughs> she teaches at UConn and Tobin is in California. So if you could let us know where you're tuning in from, that'd be awesome. Um, don't have anyone yet. And we're still waiting for a few more people to come in. So we're just gonna wait a few more seconds. Um, it looks like so we have someone from Edison. You can also tell us what, what brought you here tonight. If you don't wanna tell us where you are, that's okay. Uh, Dayton, Ohio, uh, DC. All right. Uh, <laughs> Jacques is in an elm tree. I know where Jacques really is, but we'll just keep it at elm tree. Uh, Colorado Springs. Uh, all right. Springfield, Mass. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Omar Acevedo, and I'm the Literary Program Coordinator um, here at the Mark Twain House and Museum in Hartford, Connecticut, and I'm delighted to host this program for Must Love Trees, an Unconventional Guide. First, I need to thank our sponsors. Our virtual programs are produced in part with support honoring the late Frank Lord. We are very happy to honor his memory with these programs. And we are also incredibly grateful to the Wish You Well Foundation and Connecticut Public WNPR for supporting all of our virtual programs. As a nonprofit organization, the Mark Twain House and Museum depends on contributions to share our enriching author programs like Must Love Trees, our education initiatives, and all our other events with our community. If you can, please consider donating uh, donating. <laughs> I'll provide a link for that in the in the chat a little later on. Um, and now what what brought us here this evening? Uh, we are welcoming Tobin Mitnick for a discussion with Anita Murcillo about Must Love Trees, which invites us uh, a new book, <laughs> which invites us to share Tobin's deeply personal connection to our forest companions in ways that expand the story genre, genre of nature writing. Um, now our author Tobin Mitnick is an actor, comedian, and naturalist, widely known as at Jews Love Trees on social media and has attracted attention from Wired Magazine, the Jewish Telegraphic Agency, and other publications for his combination of love for trees, comedy, and sketch. He has infinite ways to appreciate trees from their rich historical and religious significance to their critical presence in our future, to their superlative size and age, and even the strange and sometimes hilarious ways that human beings have chosen to interact with them. But while trees are an all-encompassing feature in his own life, he'd like for them to be a small part of everyone's. Our moderator, Anita Morcillo, is an associate professor of natural resources management in the College of Ar Ar Agriculture, um, not architecture, uh, agriculture, health, and natural resources at the Uni University of Connecticut. She is a landscape ecologist who studies human environment interactions and human uh, dimensions of natural resources management. Her favorite trees, coincidentally, are all evergreens, ponderosa pine, uh, Pacific madrone, Norfolk Island pine, Eastern white pine, and Australian mountain ash. Um, we encourage you to have a conversation in the chat. If you have a specific question, you can post that directly into our Q&A section. Please also note that you can click on captions. I'm actually gonna do that right now because I forgot to do that earlier um, to see uh, live auto captioning for this program. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, I will be putting a link in the chat to purchase 
Must Love Trees through our museum store. Your purchase will support our museum and our honored guest. Um, so that is all from me. Um, I will turn this over to Tobin and Anita. Uh, please enjoy. I'm almost here. OK, I'm here. Hi. Hi. <laughs> hey, everybody. How are you? Good to see everyone or something. Cool. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I, I, I can lead off a little bit. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming. And thank you so much, Omar and Anita, for, for hanging out this evening. Uh, I wrote this book. It's called Must Love Trees, An Unconventional Guide. Um, and, uh, you know, I was I was approached to write this book. I wish I could say it was it was my idea, but it's it wasn't my idea um, by uh, Rage Kindlesberger, who's uh, my publisher over at Quarto. And basically the idea was, um, can you give an enthusiast's take on trees as opposed to like what we more commonly see, which is, you know, expert takes on trees, which is, uh, you know, for many good reasons are the ones that are most numerous in the world. And I said, sure, as a matter of fact, I absolutely cannot take an expert's uh, view on things because I don't have a, a degree in horticulture. Um, and, you know, I don't, uh, I, I'm not a researcher or a scientist, but what I really do love is trees. And so I was like, okay, I can, I can take, um, I can, I can write from the perspective of a comedian or an actor um, on nature uh, about trees because I had a ton of stuff to say and God knows, like God bless my editor. She had to just mow down so many weird things that I said and so many weird essays that I wrote. And these are actually the like the most compre like comprehensible essays. Uh, so if that kind of wows you think about what didn't make it into the book. Um, <clears throat> and I think in the end, what I wound up with is um, an incredibly tunnel visioned view of trees for me, uh, but I hope what it ends up doing is showing people that there's a lot of ways that you can appreciate and love trees from thinking about them as part of, you know, uh, of the movies and uh, set design like they do, like I try to emphasize in the Treemies, which is like a, an award show that I've made for trees in pop culture, or you can think about them um, in an anthropomorphic way, which I do in the last two thirds of the book, essentially, where I list 100 uh, North American trees and I anthropomorphize every single one of them. Um, or you can have fun with them, thinking about them as a, I don't know, let me just randomly open up a picture of them, or it's bonsai, because bonsai is an amazing, amazingly, like, emotionally, uh, you have to put a lot of emotional investment into the hobby of bonsai if you want to engage in it and stay engaged in it for a long time. It takes a lot of work. Um, and I think at the end of the day, I just wind up kind of with a catalog of all the ways that I love trees um, that just cross a lot of different, uh, not boundaries, <laughs> but, um, but I think it's kind of just true to the nature of the fact that when you're obsessed with something, your obsession rarely ends at what, how these things act as resources or, uh, you know, the superlative versions of trees or um, trees, uh, you know, in your backyard or gardening, it, 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 you wind up with an all encompassing love for something um, that really just kind of subsumes every facet of your life like it has for me. Um, so that's a long winded way of saying that it's a comedic take on trees. Um, and I think it's pretty unique and I'm, I'm happy with it. And I hope that people just kind of delight in it. I don't really need to change the world. God knows that I'm not a, a climate scientist or somebody who's doing what I might refer to as very important work. Um, but I'm really happy that this exists so that people can just be a little more giddy like they are, like I am when I'm outside and I feel like a kid. Um, uh, yeah, so that's an introduction to the book. So one thing I really liked about your book, Tobin, is that, um, you know, how approachable it is in terms of the way that you, you know, the, the way that you tell it from your perspective. Um, you know, I think one thing with trees or nature, especially for folks who are new to it, is that the very quickly you can get very, find yourself very deep in science, you know, the science of it. And, you know, 
what you wrote, you know, there's, I, I think the pop culture is great. It's like a really nice warm up into the other parts um, that you personified here with, you know, the biology of trees and the species. And like you said, you gave every species a personality. Um, and I'm, I'm curious when, you know, as you started to discover trees, you know, what, how did you start to find information about them? I mean, where, where did you let your self-discovery take you in terms of someone who this is a new subject to and um, learning some of, you know, what I consider here is some, you know, pretty in-depth scientific material about the science of trees that you brought into the, you know, a very, into the book in a very personable way. Yeah. Um, well, the first place I think that I start, which is where a lot of people start, is kind of objecthood and uh, growing up with in, in a house in the woods with a lot of different objects around. My dad had all of these like really big, gigantic pine cones because uh, I grew up on the East Coast. I grew up outside of Philadelphia. Um, and my dad had all of these gigantic pine cones that would sit on the windowsill. Um, and they kind of take on a mythical status because it's like, well, we don't have any pine cones that are that big within you know, a 500 mile radius of my house. Like things must be pretty crazy on the East Coast. I mean, on the West Coast. So um, I, uh, I kind of just, sorry, my wife texted me something about, we, we have a one month old right now, so I'm, I need to be on the, uh -huh, okay, cool, um, but it's all good. Um, I kind of just started in collecting. Um, so that would be collecting pine cones, collecting petrified wood, collecting kind of tree adjacent stuff, various fossils. Um, and then when I got older, I think that I got more in depth in discovering because um, growing up I had various naturalistic interests, but getting focused on trees by the time I was maybe 24 or 25 and kind of digesting all that I could find. Um, the thing that I started with in terms of a book that I would carry around like everybody does is an Audubon guide, an Audubon guide field trees. Um, the best thing about the you know East Coast and West Coast Audubon guys is that they can fit in your back pocket, which is like my favorite thing about it. Um, everybody knows you're a, a real weirdo if you like carry around an Audubon <laughs> guys in your back pocket, which is what I like. Um, and then I kind of let that seep into various other tree guides, um, you know, the like Silvix, and then I finally found my way into Sibley. And the Sibley Guide to Trees is this remarkably well uh, illustrated, illustrated, hand painted and hand drawn, every single drawing by David Allen Sibley, who's probably best known for his work um, uh, on birds. Uh, but each one of those trees catalogs, I think every single tree in North America, close to 700 of them, and he draws the, the foliage and, and <laughs> trees of every single species. It's like one of the most amazing achievements in all of, and it's a secondary expertise, <laughs> which is like so preposterous. Um, but from there, you kind of, I kind of allowed myself to branch off, so to speak, into different uh, trees that I found fascinating from the guide. Um, I, and then I would start getting into authors, and I, it, I think it's really interesting and fun um, and accessible to find a tree writer that you really like. Um, my favorite writer about trees, especially because regionally he lines up with me, is a guy named Ronald Lanner. Um, he's written maybe seven or eight books about the pines of uh, California. One of them is literally called Conifers of California, which is my favorite tree guide of anything that I have. Um, and he just has a way of describing things that that I find appealing, not at all pretentious, because you know you can definitely get into some some deep pretension, which is fine um, when talking about the outdoors and trees. Um, but if you can if you can poke around and find a tree writer whose voice really aligns with you, then you're off to a really good start because chances are that they've written more than one amazing book on trees. Um, yeah, and then I, I kind of just like, there's so many ways to get interested in trees. Like when I started getting really heavy into bonsai five years ago from Instagram, um, I was like, okay, now I have to, now I actually want to practice bonsai. So I need one of these tiny little guides. And I bought, you know, like a 200 page, like, little book by Peter. Did you find my key over there? Hmm. Uh, I am so sorry, folks. I have to be right back to grab my car keys because we got to uh, pick up my two-year-old. I'll be back in 35 seconds.
while we're waiting if folks have not um i was just gonna say the sibley guides are fantastic for folks who are not familiar familiar with them but interested in you know even going beyond the nature just to the artwork itself they're really really wonderful um graphics in them amazing things yeah it, it, I, just, I can't get over David Allen Sibley, like just casually making, writing about 700 trees. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, for, I forget where I was, but if you, I just love going down rabbit holes. I've always gone down rabbit holes. And um, at first I got this like kind of how-to guide for bonsai. And then I got into different bonsai literature from there. And I don't know, you kind of just let, once you find a new facet in, in the world of like, something that you love it's 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 a really wonderful feeling to just order a new book and be waiting for it to come like you know you're a kid waiting for like a new picture book to come to your door the next day um yeah i love i love books books just do books don't trust any tree knowledge that you <laughs> it's really lovely um, but like half of the statistics out there are wrong unless it's a website like the gymnosperm database or something like that. And even the, that sometimes is, is not entirely correct. Um, that's, that's, that's really heavy tree nerd territory. But at the same time, like I would say that the Sibley guide is, is probably your best way in for finding out interesting things about trees that you would want to pursue further in a more in-depth text. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have it, buy a flexi bound version of the Sibley Guide to Trees of North America. It's the most amazing book there is. Yeah, those are good. I I I came up through my education through education through wildlife. So the Sibley Guides were always something that I looked at and I'm yeah. a terrible birder, but <laughs> you know, still that book is wonderful. It'll never make me a better birder, but um I am not I am it's not fun to look, look at. I wish I were a better bird. The only birds I really know about are the ones that are like, again, kind of like tree adjacent that I like, because I'm obsessed with, you know, the Great Basin Bristlecone Pine, which is the oldest tree in the world. It can attain a, uh, it can attain ages of 5,000 years. Um, mm -hmm. And Clark's Nutcracker is this That's a good one. really, really important tree. Uh, I mean, sorry. <laughs> for, <laughs> maybe that's how it simply got into them. Trees, birds, same thing. Um, to the extent that when I was up in the bristlecone pine forest and I saw a Clark's nutcracker, I like let out a, a yelp of of joy. I was like, "Oh, one in the wild! Amazing!" <laughs> nice. Do Thing you I keep a five years? What do you, you keep a tree list like birders do, a bird list like a life list? And uh, I guess I do up here, but I don't yeah. kind of like it's. I know my I, there's like many, 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 many trees kind of offhand that I can say that I I have never seen, but I very much want to see. Uh, White Mountain Ash is one of them, actually, by the way, one of your favorite trees. Um, mm -hmm. I would very much like to, especially because it holds all of those kind of um, like height records that yeah. mm -hmm. there, or at least or not anymore, I guess, but there were at least a few trees which were over 400 feet tall that were like cut down or, or lost or, or something like that. And trees like that, that kind of have a mythical status always kind of like claim a top spot in terms of things that I actively want to seek out. So that's like number one on my list when I finally get down to Australia one of these years. Um, but yeah, I guess other things that I just, I would just really, really want to see and experience are any kind of old growth forest where things have been allowed to, to grow in the way that they're meant to for many, many millennia. Um, because there you're going to see the natural expression to the utmost of of the tree and um, the tree in its, you know, most um, fulfilled growth habit. Um, and that's always a really appealing thing. Have you been able, have, do you take trips to the Redwoods or have you, I'm assuming you've been, you've made a point to see those <laughs> yes, already? That, anything accessible within like, Sequoias. even, yeah, you know, traveling to to the to the redwoods with like a one and a half year old like I did this past summer is tough because first you take the flight to like redwood city then you rent the car then you drive three hours then you have to find some somewhere to stay that like works with a one and a half year old then you have to figure out a trail where one and a half year old is not going to freak out 
um, for like hiking too long or something like that. So, but yes, uh, the, the most amazing trips that I have taken, um, I mean, I've had amazing experiences with both my young child and my wife with me, but also, also by myself as well. Um, the, the three kind of superlative trees in my imagination that grow in California are the redwoods, which are the tallest, but also, you know, of course, some of the most massive and they grow in a, a temperate rainforest, but it is a rainforest. Um, then of course the sequoias, the giant sequoias, which are different from coast redwoods. Um, they're large, they're usually recognized as the largest trees uh, by girth and volume of, of actual wood. Uh, General Sherman is like 55,000 square feet of wood or something like cubic feet of wood or something like that. Uh, but those dry uh, grow in a, a higher, drier climate and they rely on getting most of their moisture during snowpack in the winter. So they just got a lot of snow this year. So it'll be very, very interesting to explore the, the high Sierras this coming uh, summer. So it should be pretty green in a way that hasn't been in a while, which will be probably astoundingly beautiful thinking about the fact that so much of it has been burned up in the past two or three years, something like we've lost like something like 20% of the giant sequoias in existence in the past three or four years. It's pretty harrowing stuff. Um, and then finally, like I was mentioning earlier, the Great Basin Bristlecone Pines, which are the oldest trees, um, grow about four hours north of us outside of Bishop. Um, and exploring those is like exploring a, a, like an a abstract statue, uh, like a, a sculpture garden. Um, those trees are very, very, I find those to be the most emotionally moving trees to be among because you'll find yourself next to um, like a snag, which is a dead tree. And the snag itself will have been dead for a thousand years or 1500 years because nothing decomposes up there that might be changing a little bit now, which is kind of scary, but like historically it's so dry and so high that pests don't do well there and things just don't rot. So tree skeletons will hang around for a thousand years. And then right next to that, there'll be a 1500, 2000 year old tree, which is partly living and partly dead. And right next to that will be like a 25 year old, I guess you could call it a sapling because you know, 25 years is kind of sapling age for a, a, a great basin bristlecone pine. Um, and you can see this juxtaposition of living and dead and long dead. Um, the only thing you can't really see is uh, what's to come in the future. Um, and it's it can it can quite quickly lapse into a, a a transformative experience there more so even than I feel like the redwoods or sequoias but each to his own but those are I can't imagine how many more times I'm going to just make pilgrimages to those trees because they remind you of the most sublime experiences that you can have with trees um, and they're all right here it's it's a good enough reason for me to live in California to make my home here so that I can be close to those three different kinds of trees. Um, I love them so much. And the bristlecone pines is like every single one of them is so different looking. And um, I mean, you can understand why Ansel Adams was so um, occupied with them, <laughs> you know, in his pictures. Yeah, and him and his, and his favorite, my favorite Ansel Adams photograph is, uh, I think it's called Jeffrey Pine in Yosemite. Yeah. And that Jeffrey Pine is actually dead now, which is like a big shame, but um, well, a beautiful bluebird just flew into my plum tree. That was, mm -hmm. that was amazing. Uh, I would flip the camera, only oh, flew away now, it doesn't matter. Um, but uh, Jeffrey Pines are like one of my, they're, they're quite similar to Ponderosas in terms of just how they look at first. They're yellow pines, they grow kind of at the same level. Jeffrey Pines grow a little bit higher mm -hmm. um, in California, but Jeffrey Pines more reliably have that amazing scent in their bark that Ponderosa Pines sometimes do. Um, and it's a little bit more intense in, in Jeffrey Pines, but they're, uh, oh my God, the word is like escaping me. Their geographic distribution is just much smaller mm -hmm. uh, and they're mostly endemic to California. So you can't often find it, but anytime you get a chance to like on it, especially like early autumn, when like the sap is really, really flowing in a Jeffrey pine, if you can get up into a Jeffrey pine forest and stick your nose between two plates of bark, like that's, 
a very good activity, I would say. Oh, I've definitely done that. <laughs> just making sure. I mean, just, you know, like everybody who likes the pine rosa pine, you know, big part of it is the smell of Jeffrey Pine as well. You know, it's, um, and I think that's, you know, that's something there's, you know, in, related to, you know, why nature and trees can be so healing is because there's something that, you know, a lot of people look at, you know, maybe they'll, you know, there's tactile part to it. Maybe people will, you know, touch the trees, um, but they're, it's something that, you know, they're objects that you can, you can enjoy, you know, if you take the moment to get, smell the smells and listen to them, you know, when the wind blows, it's, there, there's something that, is you know you can engage all of the senses yeah i never even really thought about that before but that's what you're doing when you're experiencing a tree in the most profound way you're often just using your five senses around a tree <laughs> yeah like, that's a, that's a really immersive experience um and yeah it can be really moving wonderful personal one but if you're there with people you love it can be a really bonding experience and can shut you both up from the dumbass fights <laughs> you're just having about something right um, yeah i love how trees have the ability to silence people it's really really neat um have you like on sequoia like sequoia giant sequoia bark is uh essentially made of these very very like fine threads um and it kind of has the same properties in a lot of way as like insulation in your house except mm -hmm. much denser or 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 acoustic or a material meant to kind of like uh isolate your acoustics inside a recording booth and so if you find yourself between like two or three giant sequoias which is how they grow they grow in these groves um in the high sierras and you start speaking it can sound like you're inside of like a room because they're just absorbing both vertically and horizontally like 75 percent of the sound that comes out of your mouth um and so it's just this again another acoustic the acoustic experience of trees which is i guess not just limited to like what they sound like in the wind but how they can actually limit uh your sound as well yeah, it's, um, you're lucky to have trees big enough to be able to stand inside of there. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, um, I know that, you know, in our, you know, quick back and forth before today, um, you know, one thing that you mentioned was that you found particularly interesting, that you're particularly interested in is, you um, anthropomorphosis and I have to I have to write the word down I mean even though I study human interactions in nature I have to write the word down right in front of me too well, it's um, like every time I write it in the, <laughs> it always has the little red line under it I'm like anthropomorphosis it has to be I know anthropomorphize like you would mm -hmm. never call me out on Microsoft Word so why do you have a problem with anthropomorphosis it's the term like it has to be the term right it's a real word <laughs> it's the, so, it's a word. <laughs> yeah and, you know, and that's, you know, so I know this is, you know, you've mentioned this is a particular topic and, you know, it's like to, you know, read through your book, you, you know, it's, it's all over, you know, the, the, you give the truth personalities, you give um, the, the, um, you know, how they interact, they, how they interact with humans. Um, and I guess is this, you know, which ones I'm interested in terms of which ones did you find the easiest to give a persona to versus um, others that took a little bit more thought? Yeah, right. I mean, the, the ones that are easiest to give a, a persona to are the ones that have very distinguishing features, right? That kind mm -hmm. of align with, uh, that are easily personified. Um, for example, like, the, the redwood is just the biggest, the tallest, right? And similarly mm -hmm. with the giant sequoia. So, okay, we make the redwood, which is a very, very popular tree in human culture. It's utilized as a resource, exploited a lot of the time as a resource, but also utilized as a resource to no end. It's also, loom, it looms large in the American consciousness, all of these different things. Boom, you give it like the title of like class president, most varsity mm -hmm. letters, blah, 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 because it's, it's it's a no-brainer like this tree is just enormously popular 
Um, same thing for the ponderosa pine. It's extremely widespread. Most people know what it is. It's a wonderful tree. Um, so you can kind of find a very easy analog for it um, as a character. Uh, but yes, getting into layer, <laughs> I have to be very, very creative when I'm like, okay, well, I want to cover something from the genus Toxicodendron, which is poison oak, poison, um, ah, poison oak, poison sumac. I think I do sumac. Poison oak, poison sumac, and ivy. I guess that's also in Toxicodendron. Um, but what personality do you give something from the genus Toxicodendron? Well, it's it's poisonous, but but what can that mean? Um, and sometimes I just like kind of rely on just going a comedic or somewhat surrealistic bent on things. Like, okay, I'm just going to uh, give it this tree a poisonous personality, and this tree is going to hate human beings. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, to tell you the truth, like some of the trees in this book are kind of just me having fun with it. Like I, it's not like I said, what is, I'm going to spend all week coming up with the most three-dimensional portrait of this tree as I can possibly make. I kind of just have to, I gave myself a, I had a pretty <laughs> fast turnaround for this draft and, but it was no problem because I really like you know, making games out of things. And I have an improv and I have a background in improv and, and comedy and sketch and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, some things are obvious and some things you have to go searching for. Like there are many, many trees that don't have a very distinguishing feature. Like what's the distinguishing feature of the ash other than the fact that it's getting like mauled to death right now on the East <laughs> Coast by the green, at, green at, emerald. Emerald ash borer, yeah. Emerald ash borer. Thank mm -hmm. you very much, Anita. Yeah. Um, and I think I just wound up with the idea that it just wants to be a good tree. Like it kind of keeps its head low. Um, it's basically just kind of like, uh, tries really hard. Uh, I don't even remember the epithet that I gave it. Um, but yeah, usually I, re I relied on a distinguishing characteristic. If not, um, usually you can find something in the lack of a distinguishing characteristic um, because that can speak volumes about a tree. I think I said the, the Virginia pine was just like average and proud of it. Just like, <laughs> kind of like unflappable, unflappable. I like being average and you can't, you can't, uh, you can't get me down or something like that. Um, and then I'm, just, I'm, I'm so, this is so interesting because like in the past two or three months, I've been like in weird marketing mode where like mm -hmm. I've been, you know, trying just to sell things, which is pretty perpendicular to my personality. I just like to make weird stuff and put it out into the universe. Um, and then if I didn't find, uh, it, like for example, the the maples that I have in the book, I kind of group them as uh, anthro anthrophilic trees, like trees that really like people because people really like maples. I think a lot of the time they they grow up with maples and they feel really close to them because of the sugar maple and this this thing that they so much associate with childhood. So I was like, okay, an interesting thought experiment would be, what if the maples actually like people back? Um, then we could talk about the idea that the sugar maple is, um, you know, a, a very sweet tree, um, and it probably has that characteristic. And what if the, you know, red maple was a tree that was like very, very thoughtful, like an idealistic rebel kind of thing, and really liked human ideas, um, as opposed to like a tree from the genus Toxicodendron, which really, really hates people <laughs> and just wants to sting them all the time. Um, interesting factoid. Most of the most of the animals, both fauna and flora, animals, both fauna, all most of the flora and fauna that come into contact with the leaves of the poison sumac will not actually, or the sap of the poison sumac, which is clear, will not actually have any kind of reaction to it. Just people, <laughs> which I think is kind yeah. of the people are singularly <laughs> ill-suited toward it, um, which I think is why it. I came up with the idea of it just disliking people. Um, but yeah, you know, we grew up, I think, I grew up um, in the kind of golden era of Disney where they were just really hitting their stride in terms of anthropomorphizing things. And I, I, I don't know if there's any greater achievement in that than what they did in like the Lion King. And it'll always be that for me because that was the most formative part of my life. Yes, we know, anthropomorphizing. You're like a person too, McFly. Um, that's my dog. Um, but it, it always kind of seemed funny to me that we kind of draw the line at plants. And for plants, they 
they assume a, 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 a more flattened personality if we do choose to anthropomorphize them. For example, in, in Fern Gully, um, there was a tree that they they chopped it down and then like a goop emerged from it that was that was like supposed to represent the evils of humanity like you could tell that they were trying to do something profound in this in this children's movie by trying to anthropomorphize this this plant but it wasn't really working um and the way that we talk about plants is just with such reverence all the time and which is great. I, I just talked for, you know, 15 minutes about being around amazing trees as a sublime experience, but it, it, it cuts us off from enjoying them as, as more human-like and ascribing to them the kind of qualities that people have always done for thousands and thousands of years in order to make themselves closer to nature. Um, and I'd like to see it a little bit more with things outside the animal kingdom. Yeah, that was that was something I you know, known to you in my email. I was so happy, you know, so happy and so sad at the same time to see the whomping willow classified as the, <laughs> the most misunderstood tree because I think that's a really good example of exactly what you're talking about in which, you know, a lot of the trees, you know, let's say in Forrest Gump or um, Shawshank Redemption, you know, there's some kind of a, they're playing a symbolic role but they're not the focus. I mean, the Wobbing Willow is not only a tree, but it also becomes a main, you know, a major character yeah. in um, in that, you know, in in that book. And um, so it wasn't, you know, it's it's not just something that is in the background, but it is, you know, it it is a person, or it, it's, you know, it can distinguish you between people. Yeah. So uh, I feel like. You saying that makes me feel like I want to kind of write like a uh, like a Rosencrantz and Guildenstern or dead type thing, but from <laughs> yeah. the of a tree. <laughs> it might be really really boring, but uh, I think that I think that'd be kind of fun. Um, yeah, it's it, it, there's there's no harm in in thinking about in re you know orienting your universe in order to think about trees as the protagonist. I mean, it's it's kind mm -hmm. of fun and in a few ways. I think that what prevents people, then this is obvious, but I think what prevents people from doing that a lot of the time is the fact that trees are immobile. They don't move, um, except in ways that, you know, in time-lapse photography and green planet, they're very, very beautiful, especially if you have David Attenborough talking about how alive they are over it, over in, you know, voiceover, then you, then you understand how they're alive and how they move. But um, that's why some of this, some of this research that's essentially entering the popular lexicon now, like Suzanne Samards, is is really exciting because you get to see how uh, how trees are like communities and how they function in communities. Um, and we're slowly understanding trees as more as more human like, which is really exciting. I think we get we can get a little ahead of ourselves too into the realm of like, so trees are like people, then like you know, don't cut them down, like just like, but like when you live, I saw this really interesting statistic that was like, it's actually people who live in urban spaces a lot of the time who are the most extreme on the idea of like, absolutely don't cut any trees down, absolutely don't, um, like kind of talking about nature as this reverential space. And <laughs> they're like, and a lot of our studies show that that's caused by the fact that they feel guilty over not spending time in natural spaces. So they kind of oh. want to like make up for it in, with whatever kind of I ideas they want to tell the people about it. But there's actually no space between using resources and in a, in a respectful way and thinking about nature and spending time in nature and res in reverence and thinking about it as beautiful for people who live in rural spaces. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. It was something that that made me think. Yeah, it's um, also in work that I've done. It's you know in urban areas, every tree counts. Yeah. So you lose one tree, you don't have so many left to choose from. But in rural areas, as long as it's not you know some kind of iconic tree that people are very emotionally attached to, there are many others around. Yeah. You know, so that one isn't isn't so missed. Yeah. So. That's true. But yeah, I like that perspective better. Oh. I like that perspective better. Lots of people pour their hearts into one tree and then when it's gone, um, everybody feels bad. Like that makes sense to me. Yeah. 
yeah it's yeah the emotional connection is so important yeah um yeah another i i want to go back a second to the trees as characters or not necessarily characters but um picturing them as people the huggability um yeah and the uh, section on, on tree huggability i um it's good to see honey locusts on this list yeah, um like just, they're not not the new york city honey locust where there's like where you have to go to like deep like you know prospect park in order to find one tree that still has the spines on it uh they've all been bred out in like the honey locust trees which is in new in new york mostly uh, they're the safe ones <laughs> yeah, they're the, safe ones. the ones that yeah you would hardly notice that if this tree hadn't been cultivated it would have been a a friggin nightmare um but i mean it's it's equal parts terrifying and fascinating uh mm -hmm. like when you if you've never seen one i'm talking to everybody in the room right now yeah uh like find a garden that grows an uncultivated honey locust and walk right up to it and look at how nightmarish and terrifying the spines that it grows are um they're like it's just like these, they're pretty big they're thickets it's yeah. like the time i saw one i'm just like this is wow, like I get why we cultivated these out of this tree, but at the same time, like it is, it is frightening stuff. I think, I mean, I just compared that tree to like Michael Myers or something like that. <laughs> yep. Don't hug the tree. You'll wind up bloody. Um, yeah, that's a pretty cool tree. Honey locust, uncultivated. Yeah, the, um, I, I was sharing this with um, a group of we're all foresters who I work with on one project. And of course, you know, they started name, you know, I was listing some of them in talking about, you know, Jeffrey Pine, your ninth, you know, huggability, grade A, you know, your ninth grade crush. And I was reading some of the um, Coast Redwood person to remind you of Nana, A plus. No. Um, and, you know, of course, they start firing off all these other ones. Is this on the list? And this is on the list. <laughs> and, um, you know, this book is, a. it's like, is what's what's funny now is I'm understanding it a lot more through like the reviews of it that are actually like kind of constructive and finding its weak spots, which, you know, it has many. I'm a first time author, but I no excuses. But at the same time, like it has many and like strengths that I didn't think were strengths. And it is a very, very good coffee table book. And I don't mean that as an insult. I mean, that is something you can pick up and go, oh, that's weird. And then just kind of bond with the people around you. Um, yeah. And I'd, I'd be very happy to have it end up living there. Like, I don't need to have it sit vertically on somebody's <laughs> library in order for them to consult. Um, I'd like to have it be uh, something you can kind of gather around on Thanksgiving or whenever your father forces mm -hmm. you to go on like some sort of like tree walk in order to see like, you know, there's, there's a really cool uh, or, in, you know, like, uh, like white, white pine over by the, and you're like, oh God. <laughs> um, it, might, it might be a nice, it might be a nice meeting point for, for warring factions, warring nature factions. But yeah, I mean, you can open up any page and probably find something that people can relate to. Yeah. Yeah. So in terms of, you know, the pop culture, you know, the, you know, or even, you know, just whether or not you agree with your, your persona, your personified yeah, exactly. look at them. This is this book is also just like a collection of lines in sand, you know, mm -hmm. just like it starts with the basic idea of like a tree is a product of convergent evolution. It's not a product of a common ancestor, at least the form of a tree. You know, it's several things uh, evolving on separate lines because this form is optimal. That's why palm trees are completely unrelated to, you know, to oak trees, um, because they evolve similar forms that are advantageous but in reality palm trees are more like grass so it's fun to draw a line in the sand and say hey you know what i don't think that palm trees are trees because they don't have uh they don't have they don't have circles in order to delineate their growth year by year um what do you think of that um and then i'd rather just have people be you know arguing over things like that than some of the mm -hmm. other dumb shit that we usually argue over <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I'm, I hear you on that. Um, one thing I thought about, I don't know, I'm just, you know, kind of, you know, reflecting on things that really jumped out at me here. So if there's, you know, you know, definitely if you want to go in a different direction, you know, please take us that way. 
you know, one thing I hadn't thought about with, and maybe because I'm older, I mean, I'm, I'm Gen X, you know, I grew up in the eighties and, you know, when I think of bonsai, I think of the karate kid. Yeah. Mr. You know? yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, relating to that is, you know, like a teenager, you know, the impatience, you know, that something like, you know, the, the clipping and the shaping would take, but, but, you know, now being older and, you know, watching that movie more recently, it's, you know, thinking about some of these depictions of different trees in terms of the lessons in life. You know, the one being Mr. Mayagi um, exercising the patience and keeping himself grounded yeah. and how, you know, sometimes when things get chaotic or you're going through a, you know, a difficult time in your life or, you know, a particular challenge, how thinking about something like that can kind of bring you back to, all right, it's really important to take a step back now and that you have to be patient. Yeah. Um, so you know, it was, it's just neat, you know, thinking about, you know, some of these things in nature that, you know, we might just observe, you know, at the car window or as we're, you know, riding a bike by or whatever. But, um, you know, this was just something, it, it seemed like, you know, a very unimportant superficial part of the movie, but now in reflection, it's like, oh, you know, <laughs> I get this. Yeah. Well, it's funny that you say that because like bonsai only really like, I think, unleashes those lessons to you if you stay with it for a long time. Like it's really easy to go buy a bonsai tree and be like, okay, cool. Like I'm going to like keep this outside. It's going to be really cool. <laughs> Put on a know? shelf. It's, yeah. like, yeah, it's a bonsai tree. Yeah, I got one. Yeah, whatever. It's right there. Um, and then it dies and you just go, oh, well, I guess I suck at bonsai. It's similar to houseplants. On one of your houseplant sides, you go, oh, I'm just not a plant person. Um, but it's cool to have it. It looks cool. Um, and it really, it really takes going through several, because I got really heavy into it so, so, so fast. And I bought like, gosh, I, I must have bought like 15 or 20 pieces of material from nurseries. Um, and like a lot of the time, the way that you start off is you go to a nursery and you look for something that has a, a kind of unique trunk. Uh, mm -hmm. that somebody else probably wouldn't buy because it doesn't just conform to like, you know, what's what will look nice in your garden. And that'll actually make the most interesting potential bonsai because of the curves or, or, or just the unique qualities that it has. Um, and that's how I started. And that was like where all of my restaurant money during the pandemic was going, uh, early pandemic rather. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so many of my early trees died, but again, that's like, that's a, a lesson in term like everybody if you get really into bonsai and you end up wanting to do it seriously and moving slowly with it and paying attention to your tree and being truly seasonal in the way that you treat your trees and thinking about their health ahead of their appearance and style you know you everybody starts with with killing a few trees and it's a crappy guilt-inducing experience um but i think that i'm a much better gardener and I don't want to get too hoinky schnoinky with like metaphorically what, how I think it's helped me grow, but it, it really has, like, I, it's helped me think long-term about things. Like whenever I have a difficult decision to make in my life, like whenever I, I think about, you know, whether I want to write another book and, and, you know, whether I want it to be more serious and more focused, which don't worry, it will be. Um, like I think about the idea of, bonsai and like the trees in my garden and how difficult it's been to nurse some back from health and how quickly I killed some because I got too excited about them and then I abandoned them and you you find all of these lessons just kind of piling up from this this hobby that you pursue um it really is the best hobby I can't I can't speak highly enough <laughs> tests you in every way shape and form emotionally horticulturally stylistically how much you can watch youtube to solve all of your problems it's the most amazing thing so everybody should try it at least once um i think it's fun take a class take it for god's sakes take a class with a person that knows what they're doing for god's sakes yeah i was gonna say this sounds like something that would be really good to have some instruction <laughs> at the don't beginning do I, don't do what i do <laughs> 
don't do what I did. And then I started working with people and then I stopped working with people because I had a kid and I didn't have any time. And now, you know, I have one month old, but like when she's like kind of like sleeping through the night, finally, I'm going to find myself a new sensei and I'll, I'll start, I'll start working on some of my material in, in really thoughtful ways, hopefully again, which would be cool. I've been in keeping them alive mode for so long now. Um, <laughs> you gotta do like, something with them. <laughs> water them, like water them, idiot, water them. Right. <laughs> yeah. What time, I'm, I'm just looking at the time here. Um, do we go right. to questions or I can see a few in the chat. Um, I can see one in the Q and I mean, if folks feel free to um, put some questions in here. Um, I'm just gonna look at a couple real quickly that I see. Um, uh, Carol's asking, how do you spell the name of the author of your favorite guide to trees? Sibley, S-I-B-L-E-Y. David. Um, and then um, let's see, Emma, trees seem to permeate. So this is Emma Hunt. Um, question, trees seem to permeate through your everyday life. What inspired you to start sharing your love of trees on social media? Uh, that's easy. Um, when the pandemic happened, um, you know, I was an actor and I was a comedian and I was so used to producing new work to get attention. That's what you do. You make something new. It's like I had written these one man shows and comedic sketches and all these kind of things. And so many of them had like, I had thought they were going to be successes and then they failed. So then I found a rhythm with making a new thing and not expecting too much of it, but making a habit out of making new new comedic work or sketch work or something like that. Um, and then the pandemic happened and suddenly there was this pressure off in terms of what I had to make. Like suddenly I felt like I didn't have to make anything about other people <laughs> and I could just get as weird as I I, I wanted to. Um, so in the middle of the summer, um, I started making videos about, about trees, um, because I, it felt freeing and it felt like I would have this natural point of interest for me, this well that I could keep going back to, um, and kind of like a lens that I could use through which, um, I could be funny or do my persona, um, but something that would keep me going through through the pandemic where everybody else was kind of outside for the first time in a lot of ways. So the 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 pandemic really kickstarted it. Um, and then my friend said, you should like put your stuff on TikTok. You should get it into 60 second, you know, TikTok form. I was like, that will infringe upon my artistry. Um, I only make things that are like three and a half minutes or longer. Uh, so then, then of course it, it worked. Uh, and then it becomes, very much a like a, a, a cycle of pressures to make new things because you have some success um at least in just getting eyeballs on your stuff not financial success I still do not have financial success in anything that I do um uh but you know as long as once it gets into that cycle it's it's easy to produce new work when you have an established audience um so by the time I was two or three months into the TikTok and Instagram thing in November or December, 2020, right around when my, my first child was born, then it became very much, this is my new project. This is what's, what I'm going to do and concentrate fully on. Um, because I was having a lot more fun doing that than I ever was like auditioning and trying to come up with like new characters or comedic material out of the blue. I was just like, oh, this, Trees seem to present this infinite resource of subject matter. Um, so I'm just going to stay doing this as long as I can. Also because I had written my name on the internet in ink, as they say in the social network, as Jews love trees, and there really was no going back at that point. I was like, oh, okay, okay, great. Like, there's an, like, this is it. Now everybody knows that I'm Jewish, so I have to talk about Judaism, um, even though, like, I have just good days and bad days and good years and bad years with my Judaism, like I think a lot of people do. Um, and you really don't feel like talking about being Jewish one day. And one day you're like, let's make the challah. Let's put the talit on and have fun. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, once you brand yourself as that on the internet, you better like, you better do your due diligence and like make some stuff that has something to do with, with how you've, how you've, written yourself into the weird consciousness of the internet uh yeah 
it becomes expected. <laughs> get, which is fine, which is fine. Yeah. Like, it's great. It's really, really fun. But, you know, now I'm trying to do the weird 180 and get back into the real world and, and, and put out this book and try to attract like different audiences and speak to people in public. And a lot of it is like unfocused. I find out how little I know about trees in some in so many ways. Like part of it is like having a conversation with you, Anita, like you are a professor, you are an expert, and you have the word gist at the end of your title, you know, so like... <laughs> No, oh, that's a good, the reality of it is that's a dis disclaimer about how much I actually don't know. And I think I tell, you know, I tell my students, I tell my classes this, science is a great profession because you depend on failure, you know, yeah. <laughs> learning yeah, yeah, and yeah. failure is job security. Yes, <laughs> so, yes exactly. That's fine. But um, yeah, it's, you know, you got to remember, you know, it's really important to remember that you know, you spend your whole life learning, learning and still only know so much, so little about one little thing, you know? Yeah. So. It's I, a, a thing that I do well, which I haven't been doing well on the past few months is um, presenting information as I'm learning it in the mm -hmm. form of content, because then I'm very, very excited about it. It's new to me. And so it's less work to communicate it and put mm -hmm. it into like sketch form and to film it and to, and to edit it into something that feels exciting and alive. Um, and I can feel that that's, that's advice for anybody that wants to make content. Like you have to constantly be imbibing your subject matter or else your well is going to run dry really quick. And I feel, I feel burnout right now because I've been, I've, I love, first of all, I love my one month old. She's amazing, but she requires an inordinate amount of energy. Um, and marketing the book has kind of made me into like a, sh a shell of the social media persona that I once was. So I'm very much looking forward to reading a ton of things that are sitting on my shelf in May and and just letting it marinate for a while and and seeing what comes out the other end. Um, perhaps. But yeah. Do you, do you, is there, can I do a couple of rapid fire questions from the Q&A here? So, all right. So Michael, hi Mike, um, friend of mine. Um, what is your desert island tree? If you could only have one tree or one species for tree of tree for the rest of your life, what would it be? Uh, that's easy. Uh, that's 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 a magnolia because it reminds me of my first tree when I grew up. It's like a thing that I do at the end of the book. Like I go through all the mm -hmm. other big beautiful trees, they're incredible. Just magnolia. It yeah, I like that. It brought you right home at the yeah, end brings, there. Brings you home. It's it's, 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 it's nostalgic. Like, yeah. 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 Um. Elaine wants to know what and when are our Trammy Awards? The Trammy Awards. Trammy Awards. Trammy. 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 I want to Trammy. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, it's uh, it, the Trammy Awards are uh, awards that I made up, which are obviously like kind of half tongue in cheek, half kind of real. Like, like if I, if I do anything, I really just have to just like go full bore into it. Um, and the Trammy Awards are in their second iteration this year, and they're awards for trees in popular culture. Their original name was the Tremie Awards for Trees in Film, Television, and the Internet. Um, and generally, the idea is we have 10 categories this year. Um, they're voted on. You can actually go to, like, my in my link tree kind of thing. You can go to click. Uh, you can click uh, vote for the second annual Tremie Awards. Um, and there, everybody submits... Uh, submit submissions for each category, you know, five for best tree in film 2022. Um, and it ends up being a list of sometimes very, very funny entries and sometimes really earnest stuff. Like this one lady, Katie Smart, we're actually renaming an award after her, Most Promising Seed, uh, because <laughs> she submitted 11 things that were like, like the tree that John and Jimbo like have a conversation under in like, Reserv reservation dogs season two episode 11. and we were like oh my god like this person knows more about the trimmies than us um so it's a live event this coming saturday uh for the first time uh we're making it a late night show at 10 p.m there's a green carpet uh dress is semi-floral um it's in los angeles uh so you should come to it we're hoping everybody's a, a little bit sauced when they show up for it to have a very good time and do a weird tree award show um, but I'll also try to live stream it. That sounds awesome. Yeah. The green carpet. Excellent. The green carpet. Yeah. Nice. Um, 
two more here. I Omar uh, told me, do we have time? Can we ask the questions or? Yeah, um, we, we have a few more minutes. Okay. Okay, so um, Chad wants to know, can you talk about the intersection of being Jewish and a tree lover? And there's two more questions here that just popped up, so. Yeah, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of intersections. I, I never really know where to start on this, this question, but trees are so central to, to Judaism. And I mean, to all world religions, it's not like it's unique, um, but I like to think about the idea that their nature symbology is implanted into so much of Judaism, whether it's in the tradition of planting a cypress tree for a girl and planting a cedar tree for a boy that comes, uh, not from the Mishnahs, what is that from? I can't remember where that's actually enumerated. It's not, it's not in the Old Testament, but it's, it's somewhere else. Uh, but there's all of these kind of text-based traditions um, and text-based symbols in, in Judaism. But then it's also very, very personal stuff. Like when I was in uh, Hebrew school when I was growing up, we had, uh, my Hebrew school teacher was a guy named Frank Sager, which I, who I like to talk about, who was kind of one of these people, and I'm sure that everybody here kind of has a person like this when they were young, um, who was kind of like the Pied Piper of nature for us. And he would kind of hijack, um, you know, our lessons where we were supposed to be learning Hebrew or something like that, and like take us down into the main sanctuary and just like read us like stories about King David or something like that, because he found that the lessons in that were just a whole lot more uh, enriching for young people's lives than just me rote memorization of like weird Hebrew vowels. Um, and so the the truth is that there's so many intersections that I I can't even begin to talk about them. They run through my head all the time. They run through my head when I'm like trying to explain things in a scientific, but also emotional context to my children. Um, and that I don't actually touch on the intersection of Judaism and trees that much in this book, specifically because I think it's worth an entire book on its own. And I, I can't, I can't believe that there isn't like a, a seminal text on it at, in, in the world. And I don't know if I'm the one to write that, but I certainly want to explore it more deeply as I become more comfortable meeting my religion on my own terms as I get older. Because you know, in your twenties, you're just a you're a mess with your religion for so many people, um, and I'm I'm coming back to it in ways that I, I really like, and uh, one of those is is through trees and thinking about what they mean personally to me, but to the religion overall. Cool. Um, Jack wants to know: um, Would you go to an entmoot, or do you have a short intention span? Right, an entmoot, uh, the gatherings uh, from Lord of the Rings, where the ends get together, and it takes them like, uh, you know, like seven or eight hours just to say hello or something like that. Uh, I don't actually have a short attention span. I don't know. My attention span is whatever I'm training it to do at the particular moment. Like right now it's pretty, it's pretty bad, but hopefully when I start reading a lot more books, it'll be much better. Uh, would I go to one? Yeah. Because I tell Treebeard, he doesn't just get to say that he's not a tree because he doesn't like he, Treebeard is a tree. The answer is yes. I would go. <laughs> I would go. I'd be there. And then um, Emma um, asks, what do you plan to do from here? Will the mediums of your content remain the same or you write more books or create a podcast perhaps? Gosh, Emma, I wish I knew. Um, I'm going to write a, a kid's book next, which I'm really excited about um, with Quarto, my publisher. So Hopefully we'll we'll contract on that soon and we'll figure out when that's going to come out. Um, but I'd very much like to make it a, a flat book, uh, which is for kids for the earliest readers through ages six or seven. Um, and you know, kind of treat trees and it's similarly to how I treat them in the book, which is to say really fun characters that have very rounded personalities as opposed to just the wind blew through the trees and the celestial music that we all hear that kind of stuff because i think that's available everywhere and i, I want to do something that's new and original for kids and show them a different way to enjoy the outdoors um so i'm definitely doing that but not sure other than that i'd like to make a, a unscripted tv show that kind of mixes that stuff but that's a that's a tough that's that's tough to do oh well, good thank you i think we have to turn it back over to omar here Sweet. Anita, this is awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Anita. And thanks so much, Tobin. This is awesome. Um, so looking forward to read the, reading the book. 
um, and seeing what the different uh, characters of the trees are. <laughs> That's the part that I really want to want to read. <laughs> You'll get your fill, Omar. I guarantee. You. Yeah. <laughs> uh thanks so much to everyone in our audience for attending um please purchase tobin's book must love trees i put a link uh a couple links in the chat um you can also go to um our website and buy it through our online store um tobin's probably getting the book no, to not. show or no something else <laughs> this is a dreamy statuette <laughs> so we are <laughs> made out of different trees they're cool uh, yeah so, that's awesome what we force people to come up and hold these and read these as the trees then we take the rewards away from them <laughs> they go and sit down <laughs> and you use them for next year <laughs> and so we can use them for next year yeah i can't commission these things every year i don't have deep pockets yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome looking forward to watching watching the tree mees <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, east coast get excited yes Yes, yes. So ready. I'll I'll drink a lot of coffee so I can stay up. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, all right, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, buy Tobin's book and join us again for another author program in the future. We're going to have tons in the coming weeks. Uh, so check out our website uh, to see what's coming up. Have a great evening. Thank you, Omar. Thank you. Thank you.